Welcome to the Love Mother Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Isaac, and I hope to encourage, equip, and inspire you, busy mama, to live out your motherhood with fearless faith and powerful purpose. I know motherhood can be busy, overwhelming, and mundane, but there is another way, a motherhood full of joy and abundance. When we remove focus from worldly distractions and live our lives in the fullness of Christ, we discover the women and mothers God created us to be. Join me for open and honest discussions and interviews about gospel truths, motherhood, family, home, foster care, and adoption. This podcast invites God right into the beauty and busy of mom life and was created for mamas who crave more, more joy, more impact, more purpose, more Jesus. Let's dive into today's episode. Hello, beautiful mama, and welcome back to another episode of the Love Mother Podcast. I am your host, Kate Isaac, and this is episode 22. We have an awesome guest today, Jess Carey. And before we dive in, as always, you can head to lovemotherblog.com slash podcast episode and the number 22 for show notes. Her book will be linked there. But let's dive right into today's episode. I am interviewing Jess Carey. Jess is an author, and she wrote the book, Charting a Course, Taking a Journey with God at the Helm all about dreaming with God and acting on your God-given dreams. So let's dive right in. Hey, Jess, and welcome to the show. I'm super excited to have you here today. So let's first start by just having you share with our listeners a little bit about yourself, um, your family, who you are, what you do, your ministry. Sure. I am Jess Carey. I live in Phoenix with my husband of just about 14 years of marriage, of wedded bliss, and I have two kids, ages 11 and 10, although my 11-year-old turns 12 oh, this wow. weekend. <laughs> so yeah, so we are, um, we're celebrating the teenager years, oh, which is awesome. years ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, fun things. And I attend, uh, currently I attend Hillsong Leadership College. Oh, cool. So I'm sort of pursuing um, a life in ministry. At whatever capacity, I'm really not trying to limit that at the point at the moment, yeah. but I am looking to build God's house and build God's people. Amazing. So that's sort of like my passion in life. And I'm a writer. I love to write. So I, I like to tell stories. Amazing. Okay, we're going to yeah. get into your book in a little bit. But first, I yeah. wanted to ask, um, you are a mentor, I believe, right? Uh, for couples. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I do. I do a couple of different mentoring. Okay. Uh, obviously, being in college, I do disciple some younger uh, students. Okay. Because I am old enough to be their mom, which is <laughs> awesome. Uh, but I do mentor them just informally. Okay. And then my husband and I do peer to peer coaching for what we would say couples in crisis. Okay. So when couples go through a little rough patch, sometimes we just come alongside them. Again, it's very organic. It's very informal. Okay. Uh, and we just help them to get back to sort of healthy communication and things like that. Okay. Amazing. I love that. So your book sounds amazing. I haven't had the chance to read it yet, but it's definitely on my list to read this year. Um, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about it. When did it come out? What's it about? Just give us the rundown. Sure. Well, it's called Chart a Course, okay. Taking a Journey with God at the Helm. And it's really a book that is about pursuing the things of God. Okay. So it's pursuing the God-sized dreams that He's built into you. And then practical steps and practical things that I do and that I've found that have been very helpful to navigate the faith journey and the God-sized dream journey, including the last segment, well, second to last segment, actually, which is sort of one of my favorites, which is all about persevering. So it's, you know, as you set out on the journey and you embark with God and you say, yeah, I want that adventure. I want the big dreams. Uh, and then you hit these patches where you're like, oh, I didn't expect that. What yeah. happened? Yeah. <laughs> And so then I also share some of my personal experiences through those types of seasons okay. and how I was able to come back to hearing from the Holy Spirit, continuing to see God work through those moments and those seasons. Okay. And then the close of the book is all about praising and celebration and, and slotting that in every season of life. Okay, amazing. So yeah. you talk about these god sized dreams. What would you say to somebody who maybe has a dream on their heart? Um, and they're maybe questioning, is this from God? Is this my own will? Uh, I think often women, you know, I think many of us are big dreamers. I know I am myself. And I I just would love to know your advice on when we get these dreams in our hearts, how do we kind of confirm that they're from God? And, you know, what's our first steps into walking into them? Sure. I, 
Well, when I dream with God and intentionally set aside time and say, God, you know, you speak to me. Mm -hmm. What do you call, what are you calling me into? What do you want for my life, my family, my community, et cetera? I always benchmark that again. What does the word of God say? That's the first thing. It's like, God's never going to ask you to do something that's contrary to what the Bible says. Um, And so that's the first line of, is this of God? The second thing that I would say is really important is benchmark it against your natural inclinations. So now that's not always an indicator that you're in the will of God or that you're following that. But oftentimes the God dreams align with our natural um, skill sets or talents or even just interests. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I have many friends that are like, I want to start a ministry in um, care homes and I want to go in there and just, you know, talk to dementia patients. That's my dream. And for me, that sounds terrifying. You know, not that I don't want to be in those environments and would happily do that. It's just that's not my natural heart, you know, Um, mine, mine lies more in, I want to sit in my desk in my cave and tell stories. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm like, God, can I tell stories that will help people? And he's yeah. like, yes, yes, you can. <laughs> so, you know, that would be the second thing. And then the last thing is have people pray for you, yeah. you know, help get your community involved in helping you have the courage to take the next step of faith. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes when we take that first step, that's when we get the confirmation. Yeah, you're on the right track, girl. Keep going, you know. But it's not until we take that step of faith that we actually, you know, get that confirmation. So those are the three things I would do. That's amazing. I love that you said that last one, because I think so often we can kind of get stuck in like we have these dreams on our hearts. And then it's like, but should I do it? And I remember listening to my pastor once and he was like, take a step. God's going to tell you, he's going to open the door. He's going to shut it in your face. And so often we are scared to step into our dreams in fear of, am I, do I actually have this right? Is this actually what God wants for me? So I love that you shared that. Just take a step because that, you know, those first few steps of obedience can go a long way. And, you know, for myself, I'll just share a little bit about me with you. I am a foster parent and we've been fostering We felt God calling us to adopt, like, my whole life, really, I've had that on my heart. But um, in particular, our biological kids were two and three, and it was like God was just making it clear, like, this is the time. And I, we started pursuing that, and then we decided to adopt through the foster care system, so we started fostering kids and getting involved in that. And it's so interesting to me how God has used that first step of obedience to adopting to, and now I've been able to impact over... 11 kids and their families. We've adopted one of our foster children. We just adopted her in December. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's super exciting. She's two and a half and we've had her since she was one day old. So it was a long, a long journey. Um, But it's just been so cool to see God just honor our obedience and our decisions through it. Like, yeah, it doesn't mean everything in our dream is going to be easy. We've definitely had some hard moments with her, but Yeah, sure. It's it's interesting once you just take that first step and you start going and God starts opening doors and everything else that happens along the way. Like for myself, I used to have a blog about I'm a hairdresser. So it used to be about beauty and I just had it as a creative outlet. And it's turned into this ministry where I speak to foster and adoptive parents all over the place. I've written books. I've grown so much spiritually. So, you know, just one little thing God has in your heart can really expand into so many things. So I just love that you said take one step because I think we we freeze often, right? So, But I think you're... That what you just said about like you take that first step and then as you obey, yeah. as you walk through that thing of obedience, it opens up like an entirely new world to you. Yeah. And so I think that's also, you know, having the faith to take that first step and then literally watch God unfold so much beyond you, know. you know, beyond what you ever imagined. So I think that's like so exciting. And I hope, I mean, I know your, your listeners will be encouraged by that. It is. It's so exciting because the impact, it just kind of ripples when you as an individual mm. takes one step of obedience and everything that comes of it. And God always writes the best stories, right? I, I know we often yes. think, we often try to control things. <laughs> 
things and think this is the way it should go. But when you actually surrender and let God, you know, leave God with that dream, like, okay, I'm taking the first step and let's see what you do. He always writes the best stories. Right. So I think we live in a world with so much noise. It can be hard to know what path to follow. Um, Mm -hmm. When pursuing full-time ministry, do you... Think. So you're in college now. That's interesting. Do you think it's necessary to go to college? Like, wh- let's talk a little bit about why you felt led to go to, to go back to Hillsong College. Sure. My answer to being in ministry and having to have a degree, I would say that's not necessary. Yeah. Like, you know, we don't need the letters behind our name yeah. to say that we're an expert in the things of God. Yeah. God releases his wisdom to those that seek it. Yeah. And so I think if you're in pursuit of God's wisdom and you're you're walking out that that journey of obedience, yeah. then you're well equipped to impact the people that he puts in your path, right? Mm-hmm. Now he may not put a scholar of theology in your path, but yeah. he might. Yeah. You know, you just never know. Yeah. Um, but I went back to college because I wanted to ensure, especially because I was going to be writing to a Christian audience, perhaps to people that you know, did have a a theological foundation, Mm -hmm. I wanted to ensure that I wasn't in any way writing or or teaching anything that would be a heresy, you know, anything that would not be a a biblical truth. And I think we have to be really careful as people that want to uh, teach or mentor, Mm -hmm. we need to just be very careful about what are we teaching? Are we continually pointing people to Jesus and not to ourselves? Yeah. And I knew that college would do that. It would break something inside of me and make sure that I was like, okay, keep your eyes on Jesus, yeah. <laughs> preach Jesus, write Jesus, speak yeah. Jesus yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> How long have you been in so far? Oh my gosh, this is my second semester. Okay. Oh, so it's early days, but it is, um, it is ripping me up in the best possible way. (laughs) Yeah, I bet. And what do your kids think about it? I think it must be so encouraging for them to see you following this dream. You know, you've done the the mom of little things, and now you're really pursuing after something God's put on your heart. Like, what do they think of it? I think that they think it's cool that mom's in school at the same time. Yeah. So I think it's more of like, oh, mom's a student too. Yeah. And she has homework and like, you know, all of that. So we're living parallel lives. So that's kind of fun. We do homework together. Together, Yeah. yeah. Um, But I think for them, they have always seen my husband and I, you know, pursue the things of God in our life. And rather than sort of us in a silo pursuing those things, we always included them in that. So as we volunteered at church or as we, you know, led small groups or whatever, they were always included in that ministry. So I think for them, it's just another part of the journey and they don't see it as good or bad. It's just, so that's what mom does. Yeah. So it's good. It's exciting to see that. I've I've always said that like with my husband and I will have conversations about this and it's like, we want our kids to see us living out our faith, not just talking about it and bringing them to church, but you know, actively serving in whatever capacity we feel called to and having our kids be a part of that. And, and for us, we've seen the blessing in our kids, like being foster siblings to all of these kids. And it hasn't, wow, been, yeah. hasn't been easy on them. They've had a lot of grief and hard goodbyes. I mean, they've, you know, have yeah. kids in their life for over a year that is their little sister. And then all of a sudden they're gone. And as adults, we can navigate those emotions. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. It's hard for me too, but it's hard to willingly put my kids through that knowing I could protect and shield them from it but then I'm not opening them up to all the blessings that God has when you walk in obedience and actually serve and walk out your faith and and not just talk out your faith so I just want to encourage you I think that's so amazing that your kids are seeing that in you and that you've continually been that model for them yeah hey Kate can I ask you a question yeah of course um so how do you prepare your kids for like you know, as you've taken on these foster children, yeah. how have you been able to ready them sort of emotionally that at some point you may need to release that child back to its family? So we always go in with the posture that we're just here to help them. They know from the beginning we're trying to reunify the families and we kind of, I mean, they were, they don't know any difference. So they've, they were two and three. So we've always said like, it's not easy to be a mommy and daddy. Um, Mm -hmm. and some people really struggle with it and, and need our help. And we kind of Mm -hmm. say, 
do you think you have a good mommy and daddy? Like, don't you want other kids to experience that? And we want to help. So we really come to it as like, we're trying to restore the family. We're trying to help these right. families. And I mean, now that they're older, they've, they've experienced, you know, my one daughter's best friend, just, um, parents just got divorced and, um, a family member of ours, like they're seeing, seeing families fall apart. So I think they're yeah. getting a better understanding now that life isn't easy for everyone. Um, right. Because they are, they're blessed to grow up in a home where we have a very thriving marriage and, you know, they've got good parents. I, right. I, I try to say that in the humblest way possible, but they, yeah, don't, yeah, sure. they don't live in brokenness, but they're, they're starting to understand it a little bit more, which I think now it's easier easier for them to understand that it's a good thing when families can be restored and be and come back together um but we I made a mistake with our daughter so she we've had her since she was day one or one day old sorry and at 14 months the plan was for us to adopt her we were going into court I told them like we get to adopt her we had completed our home study everything like that we show up at court and then some like super distant relative at the last minute decided to put in a plan and legally they have rights over us. Right. Um, so we thought we were losing her and it was devastating and like having to come home. I mean, I was a wreck. So they were like, mommy, why do you look like a raccoon? Cause my makeup's all over my face. <laughs> oh my and gosh. I was just, you know, we went from a high, like, yay, we finally get to adopt her to like, we're losing her and yeah. we're her only family she's ever known. And, The situation wouldn't have been... So that was really hard, and I made an error of getting their hopes up. So to have to break that to them was horrible. Um, So I think I've done a better job since then. And it took another five months before the plan was back to us, and then another 10 months before she was actually adopted. So we just, you know, we have to trust Jesus. We we talk a lot about that. Like, we don't know. We get today. We say a lot of, like, small phrases like that. Like, we just get today. We have another little guy with us right now. We brought him home from the hospital. He's almost five months. And, you know, they we don't want him to go. And it doesn't get easier for them. This is their 11th foster sibling. But I think think they handle it in different ways. One of my daughter's grieves hard, cries, ugly cry for the day. And then she's kind of over it. Um, but we also plan like a more practical thing is we plan a little getaway. So we go to like a water park or something right after. So we're not in the house seeing the last bit of laundry from that baby that wasn't folded. Like we just kind of get away right away and just reconnect as a core family. I think that's been really helpful. But yeah, just from the beginning, preparing them, like we're trying to reunify this family, never giving them the the thought that they're supposed to be here forever and not until it's actually at that point. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That is just so beautiful. And that, that does speak to the, you know, what are your unique gifts and talents? Clearly this is like a call on your life because you're getting those, even the practical, like having a little getaway after you have to say goodbye You know, that's just, it fills your children's hearts with, hey, like we had a sad day, but joy, joy comes in the morning, right? Like, so you have this really practical thing that says like sorrow doesn't last forever. Exactly. Um, So I just love that. Wow. It's so inspiring. Thanks. I, uh, it's interesting. Another thing I should have mentioned is we also really try to facilitate a relationship with the biological parents so that the relationship doesn't cease and, like doesn't stop when the kid returns home so for example we had a little girl live with us uh three years ago she was with us for about six months she comes on family vacation with us she comes for sleepovers she just came to my daughter's we, we kind of lost touch for a bit but we just saw her again last weekend for my daughter's birthday party so it's good for both the kids leaving our care and my kids that we try to maintain those relationships still because it's not just supporting the kid. Like as a foster parent, you really have to support the whole family. And that's not always easy when you hear what's happened to these kids. But often, I I believe firmly everybody deserves a second chance and grace. And if you can be that support for somebody who's never had that and doesn't know how to be a good parent, um, it's just a beautiful thing when you can still have a relationship with them after. So that's another little thing I should say. That's so awesome. I'm like, I want to come sit at your table and have coffee. It's so encouraging. (laughs) And I think it's so amazing because God has used this passion of mine to then like open up a ministry to then starting a podcast where I get to speak to like-minded women all over. And I feel like I have these conversations all the time. Like, oh, we we need to get together and have coffee. (laughs) I mean, you got to come to Canada where it's real cold, but... (laughs) 
Maybe in the middle of summer when there it's 120 <laughs> in Phoenix. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, um, I have one more question for you, official question. We, we may lead this into another thing, but what is the most important thing you want to tell Christian women in 2020? Like, I think, you know, we're born for such a time as this. I think we're at a very unique time when we're sharing God's word in 2020. Things are very different with social media. And what would be the most important thing you want to tell women in 2020? Yeah, I love this question. Um, I don't love that my answer has to do with something that I think is a problem to solve, but uh, I feel like in our society today, there's so much isolation. Mm -hmm. You know, social media isolates us, especially when we have littles and we're moms. We we find ourselves isolating, uh, and and isolation creates anxiety in many ways. And so... My my big word for women in 2020 is whatever it takes, don't isolate yourself. Yeah. You know, pursue community with everything that you have. You know, whatever it is, even if you're painfully shy and introverted, you know, reach out to one or two people in any given week and just say, hey, would you want to come to my house for a coffee mm-hmm. if that makes you feel comfortable or whatever it is? Or let's meet at a park. Or let's, you know, go out and have a tea. Whatever it is, start to build solid relationships with people that you trust. And I think that that just in every capacity helps you navigate the storms, the brokenness, the changes in circumstances, all the things that are going to come against your calling, Mm -hmm. you know, God's calling on your life. Those individuals and those friendships, I I call it building a crew that'll get you through. You know, build that crew that's going to get you through. Find those people. um, Make sure that they're people that you can trust. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the first thing. Make sure they're honest or that you feel they're they're trustworthy. Uh, Look at their life. Mm -hmm. You know, is there fruit in their life? Are they, do they have, seem they have peace? Even if it's not all the time. I mean, we can have chaos and still have peace. Yeah. But it's like, do they have a a presence of peace? Do they um, have other healthy friendships that you can see? Mm -hmm. And those are the type of individuals that you want to invite and include in your life. But here's the caveat. You have to be the one to do the inviting. Because so many of us are waiting for someone else to invite us along. Yeah. And that invitation is never going to happen because we're all kind of sitting in our isolation like, I wish someone would invite me to go somewhere. (laughs) It's like, you be the one. Pick up the phone. Send a text message. You know, um, host the thing, whatever it is. So that would be my biggest word of advice for 2020. That's amazing. You just spoke right to my heart with that because... I so I didn't grow up in a Christian home. None of my friends were Christians, um, and I still have some great friends that are not Christians. But when I really started growing my walk with Christ, I I craved that, and I was praying for that. And I had this friend, and like we were just so we hit it off right away, and like so much of our life aligned. And I was like, God, this is like the you've you've answered my prayer that I've been praying for so long. And then that friendship fell apart, um, and. You know, for me, I, I mean, I think there's fault in both sides, but I I think I'm a pretty, pretty easy person to get along with. And I was devastated. Like, why yeah. was this friend given to me and then taken away? And then I went through this period where I was like, I got my husband, I got Jesus, I don't need anyone else. And right. it brought me to a really lonely, lonely part. And I don't think I realized how much I needed community. I was just like, I got this. Like, God's just saying, you know, lean into me right now, which... Mm-hmm. He did. He did grow my faith even more in that. But this past year in particular, he has just flooded me with amazing women and women that you just described that have fruit in their life that are just so encouraging, that are inviters, that are just flooded me with them. And I had stopped praying for it. I was like, I don't need it. I got Jesus. I got my husband. I got my kids. I'm good. And my this past year, my life has been... Like, just, I see so much fruit and there's so much more, like, just blessed relationships because I have this Mm. community now. What did you say? I love all your nautical references. I can't wait to read your book, but your crew, (laughs) 
What did you build a crew to get you through? Build a crew to get you through. Like I totally have that. And we're just, we're there for each other. One of us, one of our friends just moved. So we, you know, we're all at her house helping her clean and get the house ready and then moving into her new house. And I'm 33 and it's taken me this many years to have the crew that gets you through. But that is a hundred percent what I have now. So you just, you just spoke to my heart and I just want to add on to that to anybody listening that you need to cultivate that and exactly what you said be the person that invites be the person that picks up the phone you know pick up the phone not just (laughs) sending a dm yeah (laughs) and And when someone calls you here's the other thing when someone calls you answer your phone if you're able to like no matter what it was I always had I don't know I had like phone panic when I was in my early 20s I was like oh gosh what do they want like I don't know what they want I'm gonna let them leave a voicemail you know and then as I got older I was like no I'm just gonna find out like what's the worst thing that can happen I have to say I'll have to get back to you on that like I don't know yeah yeah. So what? Yeah. So I just started picking up the phone. Anytime someone calls me, I'm like, hey, you know? Yeah. And um, wow, my friendships, because of that one tiny change in my life, my friendships have grown exponentially. That's amazing. So it's just a tiny little change. Yeah. But yeah pick up the phone. Yeah. Do it. I love that. Amazing. <laughs> awesome. This, it, this chat has just been so great, Jess. I appreciate it so very much. So where can we find your book? You can buy my book on Amazon. Just okay. look for Chart a Course. Okay. You'll see it there. Awesome. And um, you can, uh, mm, sorry, you can link in with me on uh, Instagram. Okay. And my Instagram handle is Jess underscore Carrie okay. AZ, just like Arizona. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. I will be adding you right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one more thing that, um, well, we, I have a bunch of resources on my website, yeah. which is jessicacarry.co. Okay. So jessicacarry.co. And there's a couple of like downloadable resources about, um, you know, dreaming with God and just questions. It might help trigger or help your listeners just start out on the journey and asking some good questions. So those are downloadable on my website as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for providing those. That's awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Jess. Thank you. Bye. I just love connecting with Jess so much. I'm really looking forward to reading her book and just getting a little bit more specific on dreaming with God. I'm definitely going to be checking out those resources. So I encourage you to head there as well, jesscarry.co. And I will see you guys next week on the podcast. We'll be having a solo episode next week. I've got some good stuff for you. And as always, I just want to end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day, Lord. I want to thank you for who you are and for all you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for the dreams that you've put inside our heart, Lord. Help us to be prayerful and lean into you to know that they are from you and they're not from our own will or some influence from the culture or from the enemy, Lord. Just help us to lean into exactly the purpose that you have for each and every one of our lives, Lord. I want to thank you for giving me my purpose. I feel like I'm exactly where you want me, Lord, and I know how hard it can be when you're not feeling that way, Lord. So anybody listening today who's kind of struggling with their purpose and why they've put put on this earth, what kingdom purpose they have, Lord, I just ask that you make it clear to them and ask that they lean into you, Lord, just be an encouragement to their soul and whisper in their ear to open their Bible, Lord, and to read because as Jess said in this episode, you give wisdom to those who seek it. I just want to thank you for imparting your wisdom onto us, Lord, and just bless each of the listeners today. Give them health, give them strength, Lord. I just pray blessings over their lives, Lord, and just encourage them for being followers of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.